Hi there. Welcome to this week's episode of Waste 360's Unpacking Recycling with Charlotte. My name is Charlotte Dreisen, and I am really excited to talk today about all things solid waste in Rome. I just had the chance to spend the last week on vacation in Italy and kicked off the first few days in the capital. Whenever I am traveling, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, I am categorically incapable of not poking my nose into recycling bins, trying to translate signage, and seeing what solid waste is all about wherever I am. So what better opportunity than to do some reconnaissance I figured on how solid waste works in Rome, as many folks know they are notorious for having a lot of solid waste management challenges. I have been really curious to better understand what that's all about and we're going to dive into it here today. Um, this will be a bit of a play in three acts. Um, we'll first kind of start back at the very beginning of when contemporary solid waste management really started to evolve in Rome um, in about 1960. We'll work our way to the 2010s, 20 20-teens, and then spend a bit of time on kind of the present-ish day, the last administration or two in Rome, and how they've handled some of the solid waste ch challenges that they've confronted. And then we'll spend a bit of time on what's ahead for Rome and how the new administration is proposing some new policies, programs, and facilities to really start to gain momentum. And I'm going to be throwing in a few random assortments of takeaways that I've had from walking around. Uh, Rome happened to also be the last place I had the chance to travel to right before COVID in November 2018. Uh, so it's been really interesting for me to reflect on what I noticed that first time as well as this most recent trip there. And I definitely noticed a lot of big differences. So exciting to, to think through that and to, to talk through it all. Starting off with some kind of key contextual pieces to help us think about what's going on in Rome as a whole. Um, it's a city of about 4.3 million people in the metropolitan area. Um, not only, of course, though, are they generating the waste from their residents alone, but also the 20 million visitors that come through each year. Folks like me stopping by for a few days. Um, we know that a lot of big cities are in similar boats. They have really inflated waste generation due to daily commuters or tourists or both. Rome is definitely one of these cases. Um, and not only has their you know, tourist population kind of been historically high, but it really has been growing as a whole. It's just one kind of Example specifically, the Colosseum experienced 50% growth in tourism between 2012 and 2019. It slacked off a bit during COVID, of course, but just an example of that, you know, it's really not static. It, you know, has been high for sure for a long time, but um, does increase to grow, in, is increasingly growing, and their solid waste management infrastructure has really not kept up. Um, in fact, it's, it's really slid back during a lot of those years in the 2010s. Um, they generate about 1.7 million tons per year um, at a cost of about 180 million euro as a whole. Um, I should say, before we get too far, I am positive I will switch euro and dollar erroneously and do a lot of mispronouncing here. Um, so apologies in advance. Um, but not only are they generating a lot of that waste, and it's costing them increasingly more and more now after the, the early 20 teens where they've started to have to export refuse outside of the city proper, where they used to be able to manage it in their own landfill. Um, Rome, interestingly, has a, they all, you know, most households throughout Italy have an annual user fee for refuse and solid waste services. The average in Italy is about 300 euro. In Rome, it's 400. So not only are they paying a good bit more than the, you know, than the average, but they're also receiving some, some pretty, um, uh, you know, challenging service levels for their basic collection of refuse, recycling, organics, and um, specialty materials as well. Um, a lot of this is really due to their Malagrotta landfill having closed in the early 20 teens. The EU really came down on it during 2011. After the next couple of years, it, it pivoted from a, a landfill to a transfer station to, to export that waste elsewhere in Italy or outside of the country. We'll talk all about that and get into the nitty gritty details, but that was really one of the big pivot points where it started to become increasingly problematic. Definitely an acute on chronic situation here. Um, and as a whole, they divert about 43% of the waste that they generate in Rome. So certainly below their goal of 50% and below a lot of their peers in Europe, but nothing, you know, too shabby. In, in the U.S., of course, we've been stuck for decades, for a really long time at 34% waste diversion. So they are certainly, um, you know, a, a pace or two ahead of us there, but they've been stuck at that 43% number for many years now as well, um, kind of coming into a similar plateau that we've been at also. Um, one of the factors that also has really impacted solid waste collection 
is the fact that their collection company in, in Rome is a city owned entity that has kind of a, a universal monopoly over, over collection. Um, we know from our experience in a lot of cities in the US like New York, this is often a situation where there's, you know, monopolies in solid waste collection that this is ripe for organized crime and for lack of transparency and accountability. This is certainly the case here. We're gonna also look at all of those details at play, but definitely something that is not unique to Rome in the Italian context. Naples, for instance, um, had solid waste controlled by the Camorra crime group for many, many years, starting in the 1990s that collected, you know, really all of the city um, city operated contracts and unfortunately illegally dumped really most, if not all of that material throughout the region. Um, which is really unfortunate, but all of these factors really contribute to cyclical solid waste crises that Rome has had in recent years, as well as over the past decades. Um, and it really started back in 1960. So kind of starting our act one of the historic situation with solid waste management in Rome, um, in the um, that first kind of year or two of, of the decade in 1960, Rome released four solid waste hauling contracts for the city. And one of them was uh, was given to a man named Manlio Cerrone, who is kind of the crown jewel of our discussion here of, of organized crime and solid waste in Rome and, um, and malfeasance. He received one of the four hauling contracts, but pretty soon he acquired the other three hauling companies that received contracts, creating a universal monopoly over all solid waste collection in the city. We know that can lead to a lot of really challenging things, not only poor you know, provision of services, but, but also, of course, pretty high price premiums that can be commanded. Um, this started to evolve, you know, wasn't overnight, but certainly by 1984 was really cemented when Rome uh, Rome decided to give their, you know, one really big refuse landfill contract to his same company. So Manlio Cerrone's company was now collecting all of the material that the city generated, as well as receiving and processing their refuse. Not only were they, of course, servicing Rome, but also a lot of the towns and communities throughout the region called Lazio in Italy. Um, and for those many, many communities they serviced outside of Rome, they were charging premium prices for accepting refuse and collecting refuse and promising to process it from refuse to fuel, but of course failing to do so and often illegally dumping those materials, unfortunately. So over the years, as investigations starting to unfold, it was not only for, um, you know, for infractions in Rome itself, but really did impact the region as a whole. And of course, this was not only a problem in terms of what they were what they were doing on the front end in charging folks higher prices and failing to provide the services, but also in what was happening with the material that they did genuinely process um, at many of their facilities, including the Malagrotta landfill in Rome. Um, when the EU in the early 20 teens started to really build cases against a lot of waste processing sites, um, Malagrotta was deemed the worst of them all, which is really kind of crazy to wrap one's head around. There's a lot of competition out there, um, but of the hundred or so waste management sites that they came down on, Malagrotta was deemed the worst and was deemed non-compliant from a perspective of failing to pre-treat refuse that they were receiving, um, as well as excuse me, failing to, to provide a real lining um, for their sanitary landfill um, and, and really failing to protect the water table underneath. There's a lot of really big concern over kind of toxic impacts from that refuse management at Malagrata in the landfill, impacting the water quality of the region um, for that reason. So again, a lot of concern over illegal dumping by Manlio Cerrone's company, but also the waste they did formally process, collect, and uh, and and deal with um, a lot of non-compliance and how they were managing that material. But certainly, they are not alone. In Italy, the Italian authorities estimate that there's about a thousand, you know, unlicensed waste management facilities taking place. A lot more illegal dumping beyond that, of course. Um, and the EU estimates that out of the 250 formally licensed solid waste management facilities in Italy, about 100 are non-compliant for one reason or another. Um, so Malagrata is certainly an example of this. Now, in 2011, when the EU came down and told Malagrata you can no longer accept material and process material um, that's bound for landfill, 
they started to impose a series of pretty onerous fines. The EU designated a fine of 60 million euro that uh, Menlio Cerrone's company would have to pay the Italian authorities for non-compliance of their solid waste regulations. In addition to that, they, they lobbed on a 250,000 euro per day fine as well on top of that. Really some serious big numbers there. I would be really curious to understand how they compare and, and contrast throughout the EU, as well as, of course, comparing kind of what we look at here in our in our different states and localities, but definitely struck me as really, really pretty serious and onerous there. Um, over the course of the 20 teens as well, not only did Malagrotta prove that they were not improving conditions there, by 2013, so much so that e the EU kind of really shut down their landfill operations as a whole, and they started to pivot to a transfer station model and accept about 1,500 day, uh, 1500 tons per day of material to, to send to other landfills and waste to energy facilities in the region once their landfill operations were shut down. But while those you know landfill operations were shut down, they didn't really kind of close off that operation in a, in a you know, sustainable and well-managed way. They had piles of refuse up to 80 meters high. Um, and of course, those kind of persistent challenges with leakage out of the, the landfill itself um, into the environment and to the, the water in the, in the region also. Over the course of these years as well, Roman authorities started to have city probes into their into their operations and investigations and, and brought to Manlio Cerrone a series of charges, which he's now been successfully convicted for, leading to an arrest warrant um, for fraud as well as improper management of solid waste. It's really a humongous laundry list, all of which he denies. And he does maintain in a pretty bombastic way that he is the best at what he does in trash management globally, which is kind of a laughable, a really laughable idea to, to wrap one's head around. Um, but just as an example of how entrenched and, and really problematic that, that had of a legacy on solid waste management in Rome. For that reason, starting in 2013, when Malagrotta, you know, really formally shut down its landfill operations, pivoted to a transfer station, there were a slew of other sites considered by the city of Rome for, uh, for waste to energy, for landfill, really leaning in a waste to energy direction due to land use and space constrictions. Um, but unfortunately, no real movement on making progress there, even though, of course, a lot of material being generated, 1.7 million tons a year and, and uh, you know, needing a place to put it. For that reason, in 2016, when Virginia Raggi, the new mayor, came into power, trash was a really big deal in that campaign due to, of course, the increasingly big issues with collection now that Rome's main landfill had shut down. She asked fellow communities in the Lazio region, as well as outside of the region throughout Italy, to open up their doors of their landfills and waste to energy facilities and accept Roman, Roman waste, since that's outside of the scope of what those regional and local facilities typically, typically accommodate. They're typically just accepting the material from their jurisdiction itself. Um, some did agree to take the material, but unfortunately there, there seemed like there was a lot of faltering in the execution of that. Um, so once Virginia Raggi came into power in 2016, it was a big focus of hers. She anticipated not only trying to get refuse into the hands of other fellow Italian facilities outside of the metropolitan city of Rome itself, and ended up exploring a lot of options, shipping refuse by, by water to Sweden, Spain, Portugal, by train to Bulgaria. A lot of options were considered. Uh, but again, no real movement on, on a new facility to accommodate the material within the region. Over the course of, of this time, the, the collection company AMA that is city owned in Rome also had increasing drop offs um, of, of levels of service as well. It really started to heat up in 2017, 2018, and really accumulated in some massive protests at Rome City Hall with a huge amount of public upset and dissatisfaction. And a lot of their dissatisfaction, I think, can be really interestingly viewed from social media with hashtag degrado being an increasingly common hashtag used on photos of overflowing litter containers in the public space, as well as those pods and dumpsters, the collection kind of containers that they have on their city blocks, since they don't have door-to-door -door collection like we do in most American communities for, for single family homes or lower density homes or, or even apartment buildings uh, in a commercial setting. Um, so for both of those, those collection points, really seeing big drop offs there. So not only was the hashtag Degrado starting to become a real movement on social media on Twitter and other social media channels, but the blog Roma Fascifo, which translates to Rome sucks, really started to develop a cult following. It was started in 2007, but over the, the 20 teens really started to, to increase in popularity. So much so that the, the mayor of Rome, Virginia Raggi, sued the, the, the owner, the person who started the blog, who she actually went to high school with. Um, for 
for defamation and, and really a you know just a public relations crisis. Um, not only did she sue the the person that started Roma Fashifo, which is one of the big outlets of you know outrage and discontent over the solid waste situation in Rome, but she also sued the regional government of Lazio due to a wild boar infestation that really started to develop in Rome. While of course Rome is you know similar to other cities and having you know rodent issues and animal concerns, it really started to come to a head here in 2018, 2019. They certainly had some wild boar in the city. It's common, Chingale is common in the countryside in Rome that every once in a while would you know take up roost in one of their big spacious parks in the city. But by 2019, they were estimated to have a population of about 5,000 in the city. And normally they kind of keep to themselves, but we're increasingly getting into and disturbing solid waste containers, the pods, you know, on streets that folks bring their refuse and organics down into in particular. Um, but it really started to become an even bigger problem when wild boars started to disturb school children and people walking from the grocery store through the parking lot of the store to their car carrying groceries. There's some really wild social media uh, clips out on social media if you ever care to take a look of, of boar interfering with folks kind of, you know, like knocking at the bags that someone is carrying. It's really kind of crazy. Understandable that folks would be super concerned and that would really accelerate and galvanize folks about the solid waste situation in Rome, but also caused a lawsuit by the mayor for the regional government and uh, in turn, um, you know, really was becoming um, kind of a, a tit for tat between the city government and regional government. At this time, the national government also came down and started a task force to deal with the solid waste crisis that was um, starting to unfold in Rome in particular um, with somewhat you know, debatable success here. AMA, the city owned collection company was also as they were dropping levels of service and increasing public outrage over it. Raggy fired the entire board of AMA. And over the course of seven years, they had five CEOs, a huge amount of turnover. One can really see that the system is being stressed and, you know, is, is having a lot of tumultuous turnover as, as a whole. Due to this public concern and outrage, trash again became a really huge piece of the, the 2021 election cycle in Rome for the next mayor, Virginia Raggi, perhaps unsurprisingly lost in favor of a newcomer, Roberto Gualtieri, um, who made trash and recycling a really big piece of, of their campaign. Um, in 2019, Virginia Raggi had said, you know, we have to build a new facility and she walked that claim back, leaning instead into a zero waste plan to try and really shift the balance of material that needed to head to refuse versus recycling or composting um, is a way to try and circumvent the need for a new waste to energy facility or landfill. While Thierry felt the same when he was coming into office, he had shared with voters and constituents that he didn't want to build a new waste to energy facility, didn't think it was necessary. And really quickly after he was elected, he came back and said, second thought, that is going to be really necessary for us to manage our solid waste. So in his first year, he was elected in October of 2021. We're really almost at that one year mark for his administration. And he's been fast tracking an application for a waste to energy facility in the city of Rome itself so they can again manage their own material internally, stop needing to transport it to a very high cost, you know, both financially and a very high carbon cost outside of the region or outside of the country as a whole. Um, in addition, AMA not only is, you know, Gualtieri aiming to, to fast track that waste to energy facility for, for processing in the city, but they've, they've sketched out 13 new facilities as a whole that they would like to build in the city, three of which would manage organics, several of which would manage recycling to have an overall recycling capacity of 880,000 tons of recyclables per year. Of course, they're source separating on the front end, so they're collecting glass separately from plastic, separately from, uh, from paper. Um, and plastic and metal being uh, co-collected uh, co there. So some really promising movement, but of course that refuse piece is really key. While I think Raggi was entirely right that leaning into zero waste is necessary, that can really ease the amount of refuse that you're managing. The reality is that you have 1.7 million tons of it a year that you need to, to put somewhere. And you know the, the less you have to transport it and the less you need to pay for it really opens up budget and bandwidth to, to pursue those composting and recycling opportunities that we all, you know, we all want to and, and know is necessary. 
So Gualtieri has made some really interesting movements during his first year in particular. He's promised to hire 650 new collections folks for AMA to improve those levels of service just in that daily collection from those really adorable pods on streets for refuse and recyclables and organics. Um, in, his, in his first few months of office, I think he succeeded in hiring about half of those before Christmas in his first few months, but has made some really important progress. Also starting to implement spot checking of employees and the task list that they have. A lot of criticism was abound over folks who are on collection crews with AMA failing to actually pick up the material that they were supposed to on a given route on a given day. And that's, um, in their estimation, proved really successful to start spot checking on occasion. Um, so not only do we have that movement there, but some really exciting movement and policy with um, some, some exciting initiatives. One in particular is Rome's new policy that started in 2019 and has expanded since then of trading plastic bottles for metro tickets. This isn't entirely new to Rome. It exists in Beijing and Istanbul and some other places, but has been really exciting to see implemented here in a European capital. Um, and I think an exciting thing for us to think about in the kind of global north as a whole, something that I don't believe exists in the US today, but please tell me if you are familiar with an example of it. Um, in the first three months where it started, they had already collected 350,000 plastic bottles. One has to exchange at one of the kiosks at about seven or eight different spots around the city, 30 plastic bottles to receive one metro ticket valued at about a dollar 50 or a euro 50. Um, really exciting to see that take off and really exciting to see some superstar recyclers bringing thousands of bottles, even within the first couple of weeks of the program, but it's since really scaled up and has been able to see some pretty exciting traction there. Um, a couple of other things that I think make Rome really well poised for a new generation and a new phase of solid waste management as a whole is the fact that they do source separate. So they are really ahead of the curve of needing to roll out infrastructure and collection containers for organics in particular. We know that a lot of big cities and communities in the U.S. really you know, are just getting their hands around it. Washington, D.C. and Boston, for instance, just this year starting curbside composting programs um, and pilots are, you know, planning to do so. Boston's ahead of D.C. on that one. Um, but, but Rome has it. You know, they certainly have big issues with quality for organics as well as for recycling. But this collection infrastructure pieces, they've, they've made really good headway on, which is which is really exciting to see. And um, they also have a pretty ubiquitous culture of Nassone in, in Rome, more than 3,500 public water spouts, water fountains, um, which really enables some, some exciting reuse options that we could definitely also take inspiration from here. Um, about 3,500 throughout the city of Rome as a whole, and I want to say that I probably used a dozen or so over a few days. They're incredibly useful to refill the bottle that you have, not needing to purchase a new single-use beverage container, um, something that would be phenomenal to have in more communities in the U.S., whether a dense capital or, um, or, or a more modestly sized, smaller, medium town. I'm really exciting to see that. The last couple of things that I was really excited by in my trip to Rome, um, I'm going to just pull a couple of packaging examples that I have here. Um, one was a plastic bottle. Um, this is not unique to, to Rome or Italy, but um, definitely is occurring in a lot of countries in Europe. Um, but basically ensuring that the closure for a container is attached to the bottle. So we can see here that the, the cap here is attached to the ring below the lip of the, the closure. Um, so the, the cap doesn't come off. If the bottle is getting to a recycling bin, the cap is coming along with it, which is great because we know that caps make up a really high portion of litter in the US and elsewhere um, where this doesn't happen, uh, where they aren't necessarily attached. So one still, of course, has to recycle the bottle to recycle the cap as well. But because caps are too small to be recycled solo when they're in single stream recycling systems, this is a great way of ensuring that the cap will come along with the bottle and the consumer doesn't have to think about it. Um, some of them don't twist off and stay attached. Um, some snap back, which I also really like the, the feel of. Um, it, it feels a little more secure to me just kind of from a a consumer perspective, um, but would love to see other examples of that if anyone has stumbled upon some. Um, the last really exciting example that I saw on shelves everywhere were paper pouches. Um, apologies if this is crinkly. Smarties are my number one favorite candy. Um, so I was really excited to see this. When I was last in, in Italy three, four years ago, right before the pandemic, um, I suppose it's getting to that point years wise. Um, they were in thick multi-laminate um, you know, pouches that would not be recyclable curbside or via a drop-off program that we have today. Really exciting to see some paper pouches as a recyclable option. Of course, when you have metal and paper and plastic used together, unfortunately not recyclable with our infrastructure today, but paper pouches that are pretty simple construction like this are indeed recyclable. 
Um, was super excited to see that along with, of course, their, their little paper boxes here. Um, unfortunately, too small to be recycled, but it was really cool to see, you know, maybe not ubiquitous paper pouches, but um, definitely really starting to take over a lot of the scene um, on, on store shelves. Um, I'll stop here. I know we've gone through a load of different events and factors that impact solid waste management in Rome today. I am really excited to see how the mayor, the new mayor's administration, Roberto Gualtieri, you know, rolls out a waste to energy facility, new dumpsters, which he's claimed to do within two years. We're about halfway through that two year term. So excited to see in the year ahead what new progress there is on streets for multifamily residents and single family residents that like to use, um, as well as some of their really exciting new initiatives like exchanging plastic bottles for Metro tickets pan out. Um, I hope you've enjoyed. Please, as always, drop a comment right below this video on Waste360's website or reach out over Twitter or Instagram if you have any questions at all. Would love to hear your thoughts and hear if you have any other interesting takes from any travels recently. I'm on Twitter at Char Dreisen, C-H-A-R-D-R-E-I-Z-E-N, and Char Recycles on Instagram. Thanks so much.